All right, so our pre-prandial speaker is uh, Nick Barrett coming in from um, Zaclé. So um, another uh, talk on imaging, but this case of uh, ferroelectric imaging. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present some of the results that we've got recently on ferroelastic doing walls. And it's nice being here because I'm absolutely not a historical <coughs> member of this conference, I'm quite new, relatively new to the, to the field, compared to many of you, um, and colleagues talked about the Williamsburg conference, the Williamsburg workshop, I have been to Williamsburg, I didn't even know where it was, so it's really nice to come here, and also get uh, insight, an interesting insight into some, some US history. Okay. So I work for the CEA, the French Atomic Energy Authority, and the results today um, are on imaging of the surface potential in ferroelastic uh, domain walls in CATA, uh, in CATS, calcium titanate. So I might have some differential in that way. Um, so I'll uh, some justification why we're interested in these uh, domain walls, in these polar domain walls. Short introduction into imaging uh, surfaces with low energy electrons, and I emphasize it's low energy electrons, we're not using uh, energies compatible with uh, transmission electron microscopy. And then finally, the results on the are on the domain walls in in CTO. Um, so uh, CTO calcium uh, titanate is central symmetric. It's a non-polar, it's almost prototypical archetypal non-polar uh, oxide. Um, it's ferroelastic, and its primary order parameter uh, describes, in fact, the octahedral tilts. So two types of octahedral tilts. And what's important, and this is a calculation done by uh, Carlos Ferreira and Eckhart Salve, uh, is that as you go through the ferroelastic domain wall, the twin wall, this primary order parameter by symmetry goes to zero. When it goes to zero, the system locally to minimize this energy uh, will uh, allow off centering of the titanium uh, cation in the center of the octahedron. And this off centering, locally confined to the domain wall, makes the domain walls polar. And the polarity is in the plane of the, uh, of the wall. Um, now, just to emphasize that sometimes we got confused about this, there's been a lot of uh, work done on neutral and charged domain walls in ferroelectrics. We're absolutely not looking at the same, uh, the same sort of phenomenon. Um, the domain walls in calcium titanate are charged neutral, uh, and, uh, and the polarity is in the wall itself. It's just something I think is probably important for the future to remember. Um, the evidence, experimental and theoretical evidence for polarity, well in TEM, you have to take my word for it, but you can go and look at uh, this paper from uh, Sandra Van Aert. Uh, so there's off-centering, and you get a polarity uh, along the domain wall. These are the two uh, ferroelastic domains. Um, you can also get a response using second, uh, second harmonic generation, uh, and this basically means that there is symmetry breaking, and the symmetry breaking obviously is happening at the domain wall. <coughs> Theoretical calculations show that there is, in fact, a net, the, 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 the or the, the screen is the domain wall plane, and you actually have a net polarization running along, uh, running along the domain wall. However, uh, these are to a certain extent indirect, and so what we'd like to do is actually look at this, detect directly this polarity. And to do so, as a technique we've been developing for a while, we've discussed that we'll be using it and applying it to, to charged surfaces. Uh, low energy electron microscopy. This is a schematic of the, the, the instrument. Uh, you have electrons which are actually about accelerated at 20 kilovolts through a series of lenses. They go through a sector field, it's magnetic, um, in order to send these electrons at uh, perpendicular to the sample surface. Just before the sample surface, they are decelerated. The sample itself is at virtually at the same potential, uh, with a very slight difference, which is also called the star voltage. And therefore, the electrons arrive at the sample surface interact with the surface potential at an extremely low energy of the order of an electron volt. And therefore, they are very sensitive to any modulation in the surface potential. So the electrons are therefore reflected or backscattered, uh, and then they go through the sector field, deviated obviously in the, in, the, in the opposite direction, and they use the projection lenses, and we get the image on the screen. There are two types of uh, two regime in this sort of microscopy. MEM, which is mirror electron microscopy, the electrons do not have enough energy to penetrate the sample surface. They're reflected before coming into contact with it, 
Now that is very useful, particularly as we're looking at insulating uh, samples so we can avoid charging. And then the other uh, regime is lean, true lean, which is low energy electron microscopy, where the electrons penetrate the first few nanometers of the sample surface and are backscattered. And so there's an interaction, and you can actually get some chemical information from this, uh, this regime. Okay, so we're actually not the first people to do this sort of uh, work, interacting electrons with surfaces. A lot of work was done by Renaud de Lyon in the, in the 1980s, um, but he used a secondary electron emission in a, a scanning electron microscope. And of course, this is, here's a, an example of some of, his, uh, some of his work. You can see the, the, the surface of the and titanate, and it's got a response which you can translate in terms of polarization, so this is a third electron sample. Um, but there were a number of problems, notably with, uh, with sample charging. Uh, what we can do with uh, low energy electron microscopy is one example. This is a completely different system. It's a thin film uh, with ferroelectric domains written into a, it's a, it's a ferrite thin, thin film. Uh, electrons coming in. The domains are written down and up. This modulates the surface potential. And so you can see from this cartoon what you would expect electrons to be reflected at uh, different energies. And this is indeed what we see. This is basically the kinetic energy of electrons going in. And uh, you can see that there is a, that's a fraction of, an, uh, of a volt uh, difference in the surface potential, and this just reflects directly the surface charge. So we have a non-contact uh, uh, imaging technique, uh, and which we can relate directly to surface charge, surface potential variations. Um, now, if we translate that uh, for our, the problem in hand, the polar walls in calcium titanate, at the intersection between the domain walls and the surface, we want to expect uh, because of the polarity, we want to expect opposite charges, depending on the direction of the polarity. Um, and so, very locally, we would expect a surface potential uh, modulation. And indeed, this is an example of the result we get. We measure the electron uh, intensity, the reflected intensity, coming from the surface uh, at the domain walls. And we get very small differences, but nevertheless significant, of about 100 millivolts. Between, uh, uh, between, uh, between walls. And this we can relate directly to the polarity of the wall. So we have a way of recognizing wall polarity at the surface. Um, the pre-characterization results by optical microscopy, uh, we can see these uh, ferroelastic domain walls uh, been identified. It, the surface looks basically like a factory roof. Um, it there are factories around. Um, ridges and valleys. And uh, here, they're, here they're, they're being labeled. We look at exactly the same area in AFM. And so there's a topography, a sort of 3D view of the, the topography. And again, uh, different uh, ridges, different uh, domain walls and the, and the valley walls. Um, the angles are important. I, I talked about, about that just uh, in, in, in the next slide. So there are some very well-defined angles for these twin walls. And this is what you would actually expect uh, because, of the, because of the symmetry. And because we're, uh, the, the structure is actually orthorhombic, and therefore there's going to be a slight deformation with respect to the two uh, cubic uh, structure. We also looked at the, the chemistry of the surface. This is area average chemistry, it's XPS. And what we do see is that at least average over the whole surface that we're analyzing, uh, there is an, uh, an, an insignificant amount of oxygen uh, vacancies. This doesn't mean that the oxygen vacancy near to the wall is, uh, is insignificant. Um, now the wall angles uh, were actually calculated uh, using the symmetry consideration and the coefficients of the strain tensor for the orthorhombic distortion with respect to the cubic uh, structure. We calculated the possible domain walls. Uh, in, we won't go in at all into, into the details, but the ones in, uh, in bold type are basically the solutions which correspond to the domain walls we have observed with the optical microscopy. This is important, it gives rise to two angles. Uh, if you look at the blue uh, wall, you have an angle which is the inclination angle here, it's 36 degrees with respect to the sample normal, and the second angle here marked is uh, 135 degrees with respect to uh, a reference direction in the surface. Those two angles we can use to characterize uh, our domain wall. There's a third information which is obtainable from this calculation, and that's the ridge or valley angle. Now, I'd just like to emphasize that these angles are extremely small. 
a fraction of a degree. This surface basically looks flat, but it is a, there is a, when we talk about ridges and valleys, these are ridges and valleys that are very flattened, uh, flattened out. Nevertheless, they do exist. Um, the first uh, uh, mirror electron microscopy images. Uh, these are taken, um, here's the scale bar, so we're always in this sort of ball bar. These are taken, uh, first of all, at a very negative star voltage. Therefore, the electrons do not uh, interact strongly with the sample surface. They're reflected before getting there. And in fact, the contrast here is actually not very, not very high. There are three main points to, to, to see. First of all, if you look at adjacent domain, these are the domain walls. Hmm? Now, if you look at adjacent, the, the adjacent domains, there's basically no contrast between the, the intensity between uh, two domains. This is what you expect. It's, uh, it's calcium, uh, calcium titanate, it's not polar, but far from the domain walls. There is, however, a clear contrast between the domain walls and the adjacent domains. Uh, sometimes the domain walls are brighter, sometimes they're darker. The third point, surface contamination, all these bright spots, these play absolutely no role in what we're, in what we're doing. They are present. In fact, they actually serve as a, a useful uh, calibration technique for the lining of the microscope. When we increase the star voltage, electrons start to penetrate into the surface, and the contrast sharpens up. Uh, the domain walls seem to get narrower. In fact, the contrast is getting sharper, and it is also, a, it's also getting, uh, getting much stronger. And we see both uh, dark and light, uh, dark and bright uh, domain walls. Um, so we can identify these walls. Now, what, uh, I mean, I should just go back, I should, should say that. Um, if we think about the, the, the model of the surface potential, this also allows us to identify, without any further analysis, what is the polarity. Here, because they're darker, these are uh, positively uh, bold domain walls. In other words, the polarity is pointing upwards towards the microscope. In this case, the brighter intensity means that the polarity in the domain wall is pointing down into the, into the bulk of the, of the sample. So we recognize, and we identify domain walls, and we identify their polarity. Um, now, uh, if we crank up the voltage, the, our electrons, as I said, can penetrate into the sample. So in other words, we can inject negative charge into the near surface region of the sample. And this is what's been done here. Um, this is just the image from the previous slide. And then uh, increase the star voltage to 8 volts, electrons start penetrating the sample. We know how many because we, can, uh, we know what the, the, the emission current is. Um, if we had a better microscope, which we do have now, we could even measure the drain current. Um, and then after some like half an hour, we've injected a lot of electrons. And if you look carefully, the contrast has changed. Uh, the, this is still, is still quite present. But the domain wall, which is up here, has actually, a, has actually disappeared. And this domain wall, the contrast is much weaker than uh, earlier. It's traced out. We've uh, plotted it out. First of all, for the first few minutes, you can see that there are, for example, R1, which is this, uh, which is the bright wall uh, coming down here. The contrast, as defined by the difference in intensity between the domain wall and the domain, is constant. It doesn't change. And it doesn't change over the whole uh, irradiation time. However, other walls, notably R2, which was this uh, vertical wall, which is sharp here and has disappeared here. In fact, after half an hour of electron injection, there is no contrast whatsoever. It becomes invisible. The electrons have actually screened the polarity, the positive polarity of this domain wall at the, uh, at the surface. So we can screen it. It's almost half a switch. Um, but uh, what happens when we cut off the... the Electrons. Why don't we cut off nothing? Um, here we're looking actually at um, uh, three different regions from the same, from, basically from the same, from the same image. Uh, we're looking at these. Uh, the, this is after having uh, injected the, uh, our low energy uh, electrons, and the domain wall contrast has, has disappeared from R2. Oh, that's a scratch, by the way. Um, and uh, the R1 is still clearly, clearly visible. R2 is a, 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 it's no longer no longer visible. Then what we do is that we heat the sample up to something like 200 degrees. And we plot it out a few, a couple of the three of the, the, the contrast of three of the domain walls. Once again, this R1 domain wall, the bright one, as we heat it up, basically the contrast doesn't uh, change. We've also plotted out the, uh, the domain walls whose contrast did, was reduced by electron injection. And look what happens. As you start increasing the temperature, 
the contrast goes gets uh, gets stronger and uh, and stronger. Um, and this is shown here after the annealing, exactly the same area. The contrast comes back, and it comes back in exactly the same place. The domain walls have not moved. What has happened, uh, in our opinion, is that by going to a sufficiently high temperature, we have actually uh, freed the, the electrons tra trapped in a sort of space charge region around the, the domain walls. And as the temperature goes down again, you can see the cycle. We've, uh, we've annealed up to 330 degrees C. We go back down to room temperature. This contrast remains. So what we actually have is um, uh, the uh, polar domain walls, at least the positive polarity pointing up the way, which we can screen by charge injection. Then, when we, uh, we anneal the sample up to something like 330, here 330 degrees, come back down to room temperature, and we get back exactly the same polarity. So we've got some kind of robust uh, nanometric um, charge, well, even some, some, some kind of a device. Unfortunately, it only goes in one way. Uh, the, we have the, the opposite polarity. Uh, it, it remains unaffected by the, by the charge of data. So that's just to summarize the, the results. We can recognize uh, the polarity of the, uh, of the domain walls, the domain walls of the surface of calcium titanate. Uh, we inject electrons. It will screen the positive polarity walls. And then when we anneal, we get back exactly the same structure as we had uh, previously. Okay, so it remains just to uh, mention who did the work, who did all the real work. A lot of this comes from the PhD thesis of Guillaume Natar, who did a thesis with us and also with uh, Lise in Luxembourg. I think now he's a postdoc in, in Cambridge. Uh, the samples were prepared by Raphael Lomont uh, at uh, Orsay. And uh, also I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, we have time for one or two brief questions. Uh, song? So I have a general question. Uh, this uh, ferroelectric, uh, or ferro elastic wall becoming, you know, uh, ferroelectric, is this a general for any system or just a question type? Oh, no, it is predicted theoretically. It's a general prediction. Uh, for uh, for ferroelastics, uh, where you can get some off-centering, well, you could get off-centering between a cation and an ion. And the so, so, for example, like uh, perhaps guys, you know, perhaps guys, orthorhombic structure, you know, the orthorhombic uh, twins are very common. And <coughs> I mean, words are always you know, very common. So, all of them should be. The theorist of prediction is general. General. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, David. Can, can I follow up? So I just want to make sure I understand. Is it the case that for a given...